On behalf of Civic's board and staff, welcome to the ninth annual Darden Awards recognizing extraordinary community leadership. Tonight we honor a man, Dubby Wynn, who has played a key role in shaping our region. And for the first time, we are honoring a corporate citizen, Town Bank, for its myriad contributions. If attendance is a measure of our honorees' impact, then Dubby and Bob Aston and team, you all have done your work well, because tonight is a record for attendance. Please join me in congratulating them. <laughs> Speaking of attendance, we're honored to have with us six past Darden Award winners, and I'd like to acknowledge their presence. Harry Lester, Deborah DeCroce, Paul Hirschbiel, Jack Azell, Bob Aston, and Vince and Suzanne Mastrocco. Again, please acknowledge their presence. Thanks. When I joined Inside Business in 1999, Town Bank had just been founded. So I've had the pleasure to watch the organization, not just as a community benefactor and leader, but also as an evolving business story. And what a story it's been. And Dubby, it's hard for me to imagine saying these words, but I can recall you from nearly 50 years ago when I was at your parents' home with your younger brother and you walked in wearing your Norfolk Academy athletic jacket. <laughs> it's true. No doubt just finishing tennis or basketball practice. While I didn't understand the concept of leadership at that age, I knew that you were a young man of great purpose. More than 15 years later, when I joined Landmark Communications, I watched you lead the company as CEO and clearly understood how that early purpose had become fully defined in a true leader, and I've admired you greatly ever since. Tonight's program would not be possible without support, and Civic is pleased to recognize some of Hampton Road's most generous companies and individuals. Please allow me a minute or two to give them their due thanks and hold any applause until I've finished. Our presenting sponsors tonight are Charity Volman and Jen Spring Family Offices, Jack Ross and his team at Dominion Enterprises, Bruce Thompson and Gold Key PHR, and Larry Berner, Wayne Wilbanks, and their team at Wilbanks, Smith & Thomas. Our table sponsors are Tom Prevett and Bon Secur, Charles Barker at Charles Barker Automotive, Claudia Keenan in Eastern Virginia Medical School, Deborah Croce in the Hampton Roads Community Foundation, and Paul Hirschbiel, Bruce Bradley, and other members of the Community Foundation Board. Bill Van Buren and Ann Crenshaw and the partners of Kaufman and Canoles. Shep Miller at Kitco Fiber Optics. Headmaster Dennis Manning at Norfolk Academy. ODU President John Broderick and the ODU Office of Community Engagement. Dennis Elmer and his team at Priority Automotive. Jeff Wasmer, CEO of Spectrum. Jack Frieden and TFA Benefits. Ray Breeden, Tim Faulkner, and their team at the Breeden Companies, and Tommy Johnson, Toy Savage, and their partners at Wilcox and Savage. Our community sponsors tonight are Gary McCollum and Cox Communications, Wick Mormon and Norfolk Southern, Rodney Oliver in the Port of Virginia, Tom Franz, the CEO of Williams Mullen, and John Lawson, CEO at WM Jordan. Our media sponsors tonight, whose handiwork you will see in a bit in our videos, our Seven Point Advertising and Marketing, and Haycox Productions. And I'd particularly like to thank Chris Cal, Cagno, and Joe DeLatte of Seventh Point for their beautiful video work. And finally, we know everyone here tonight is a friend of Civic and out to support Dubby and Town Bank. But a few folks wanted to offer special expressions of that. So our friends of Civic are Congressman and Mrs. Scott Rigel, Optima Health, Wick Mormon, Rod and Cindy Rodriguez, Virginia Beach Mayor Will and his wife Bev Sessoms, Mike and Becky Siphon, and last of all, one I better not forget tonight, Marguerite Power. Okay, now you can join me in thanking this large but very generous group of people.
Now it's my pleasure to bring up the president of Civic, Ann Crenshaw of Kaufman and Canoles. And to correct that, I'm not the president of Kaufman and Canoles. I'm the president of Civic Leadership Institute. Good evening. On behalf of the Civic Leadership Board of Directors and staff, welcome to the ninth annual Darden Award for Regional Leadership. Tonight we honor a man who has meant much to the region, and for the first time tonight, we honor a corporate citizen for its contributions to the region. And it looks like we've made some excellent choices on both respects, because our attendance tonight is the largest on record, by well over 100. So. We're really glad to have everybody here. <clears throat> None of this would be possible without the support of our extraordinary sponsors, and we're proud to count among them some of Hampton Road's most generous companies. Tonight we inaugurate a new award, the Darden Award for Corporate Leadership. The award is designed to recognize companies that are at work in the community throughout the region, and you'd have to look pretty far to find a better example of corporate citizenship than Town Bank. As you're about to see between them, Town Bank and the Town Bank Foundation have given more than $22 million in donations, scholarships, and grants to hundreds of local organizations. In fact, town is so committed to the community service as a cornerstone of its mission that it produced this video to let others know the impact of those community investments. And we'll start the video now. I've never seen a company so involved with the community. From the very, very beginning, Town Bank said, we are going to invest in our community. We're going to make it a better place to live. So. Um, I, I think the most important thing that it's done is to uh, show Hampton Roads what a good corporate citizen it can be. It's banking locally, it's hiring locally, it's, it's helping Hampton Roads grow. I can't imagine any bank having done a better job, not only for the shareholders, but for uh, the community that it calls its home. Our investments in this bank have made a difference in Hampton Roads. That's what makes me proud. When you put an individual with a disability on the back of a horse, it's a whole different level of, of a therapeutic experience. It started as a backyard endeavor um, to be able to help individuals with disabilities. And then when we realized there was such a need, we reached out to Town Bank to inquire about funding to support us. And Town came back as, as one of our largest donors. So truly, every piece of our building has a piece of Town Bank in it. This lady walked in with her daughter, and her daughter has developmental delay, and you know she really wanted something for her daughter. Um, I worked with her throughout the eight-week lesson, and when her lesson was over, she looked at me and she just burst into tears, and she said, you know, my daughter now has something of her own. And um, that's what we do here. We give them something of their own. I bounced for 42 days in the Pacific Ocean. We wound up at Iwo Jima. I saw the bombing of the island, and I saw the first wave go in. There was a lot of hollering, yelling. There was that beautiful flag floating in the breeze on top of the mountain. And I just can't describe the, the feeling that surged through my heart as I saw that red flag fly up there. In World War II, there's about 16 million people served in the armed forces. And by the mid-2000s, we were down to around 3 million or so, and they're dying at the rate of about 1,200 a day. So what Honor Flight tries to do is to get as many of those veterans, both men and women, up to Washington to see that memorial that was built for them. And we won't be done until we've uh, taken every World War II veteran in this area on a trip to their memorial and say to them thank you for what you did for us and for our country. 
If we didn't have the support of companies like Town Bank and, and others financially, we couldn't put the trips together. No matter where we stopped, what we did, everyone was there to greet us and thank us. I was three years old when I was diagnosed with a rare form of liver cancer. The doctors gave me like a 30% survival rate. Told my parents to pretty much kiss me goodbye, prepare for the worst, and then I came out kind of on top. And I had the mentality, if you can beat cancer, you can beat, you can do anything. We're building a custom swing set for a little girl that's fighting leukemia. Her name's Lily. She just turned four. She was always outspoken, running around, very playful. But since she's just started the chemotherapy, um, her mentality's kind of changed. She's kind of been down in the dumps. The one thing they can't get back is their childhood. And with that, the swing set represents them kind of a safe haven, just to kind of have a good time and to be able to be a kid. They're fighting an adult battle. And it's no fault of their own, but with Rock Solid and with Town Bank, we're actually building hope for the child and it allows them to be a kid. The simple dreams of these people are just to be like you and me. You know, just to have the chance to earn a paycheck. And the dignity of that is just immeasurable. One person said, nobody sees me, but when I work, I exist. We serve people who are the most severely impaired. We have people that are the rejects of every other program because we believe everyone can be a part of this community. These folks that would have normally never seen a workforce, never, okay? In 2010, they made 1.2 million in wages. In 2011, 1.5 million in wages. Now, that's an economic benefit to Hampton Roads. The individual person may not you know, have a huge impact in Hampton Roads. But see, what we've done here is we said, okay, nobody's getting left behind. And town recognized that this is something that yields, that's a lifesaver. I mean, I don't have any better way to say it. I had a woman come to me and she was in tears and, and she, you know, just streaming down her face. and. And I was, and she said, I just want to thank you. I just want to thank you. I didn't even know who the woman was. Um, and she said, my daughter is 38 years old. And for the first time in her life, she spoke. And it's because she's working in your laundry. I mean, it speaks volumes. I mean, <laughs> I mean those are the stories that I live for. Town has had the wisdom to invest in the most vulnerable people and make them valuable. You know, to the philanthropists, I say, dig as deep as you can and, and invest in town bank because they're giving back, you know, and, and that, that's what we need, you know. I mean, that's what I think defines Hampton Roads, and I think the town is at the forefront of defining that. When town bank leads, other corporate citizens will follow, and town bank has been a leader in investing in Hampton Roads. I invested in the people that started that bank and the way they do business and makes me feel good to know that the company I've invested in is putting some of that money back in very important places in my community. Investing in Town Bank means that you become a member of a family that provides the best possible service of any bank anywhere and it keeps its money in Hampton Roads. Pretty simple really. Wow, that was a great video. It's now my pleasure to introduce the Chairman and Chief Executive Officer of Town Bank, G. Robert Bob Aston, to receive the 2013 Corporate Darden Award for Regional Leadership.
Thank you. Thank you very much. It's a real pleasure to be here tonight uh, on behalf of our town family uh, and to accept this prestigious award. I'd first like to thank the members of Civic for recognizing our organization and for the good work that you do in creating future leaders here in our community. With Josh Darden's name on this award, uh, there's really no greater honor that someone could get here in our community than to have something with his name on it. We miss him here tonight. In 1998, a small group of us uh, began to gather in my garage out in the Hatton Point area of Churchland and to talk about uh, starting a new bank. And during those talks, uh, it, it's strange, I guess, but we never really spoke much about the business of banking because that was, in essence, was a given based on what we were trying to do. But we sat around for several weeks talking about what it was that we wanted to, to create. And our dream was to create a community asset for this community. We had observed over the years the, the merger wars, I guess you could say, when most of our banks that were headquartered here became part of large, larger organizations and, and not disappeared particularly, but certainly from a leadership perspective, there was, there was some slippage. So our dream, dream was to create a community asset. The ultimate goal was to enhance the quality of life here in Hampton Roads and to serve others and hopefully to enrich lives. We wanted to be uh, a source of community pride by being a leader in community support. And I say that from the viewpoint that, that these were things that were, that were part of the mission and vision of what we hope to create in this community. We built this company uh, on a foundation of caring for other people to a group of people that believed in the inherent goodness of people and basically to serve a higher purpose than simply to, to make money as a, as a company. We were fortunate to have a group of shareholders that stepped forward uh, like Harry Lester who believed in what we were doing and who embraced the notion that giving to others would not be an expense in our company but would continually be an investment in improving the quality of life here in our community. We have assembled a team of folks to help build this company that essentially um, I would characterize as givers. Uh, we um, look for folks that really were fulfilled by serving and benefiting other people. And that made our job uh, a lot easier when we opened the doors of our bank as well. We wanted to create a culture of extreme volunteerism. And today, uh, sometimes I get embarrassed with the number of things we ask our employees to do because it seems like it's one project after the other, but whenever that email goes out, there's always a group that responds and, and comes to the table. And I guess that, you know, we never uh, started out with a goal to be the biggest bank headquartered in this community. We never, even, we never even talked about that because that seemed like a sort of an impossible thing, to be honest with you. But we just wanted to be the most caring organization and to be the most respected. So tonight, this award really stands as a tribute to the good work of our 1,500 family members today, our directors, our shareholders, and the 50,000 members that we are privileged to serve each day in our bank. It is truly an honor to be here tonight to accept this on their behalf because this group is seated down here in front of me. They do most of the work. I just show up at functions like this. Uh, but in closing, uh, I heard a quote by Tom Brokaw who said, uh, it's easy to make a buck and it's a lot harder to make a difference. And I am just here to say that Town Bank and this community uh, we put our focus on making a difference. And I'm greatly honored to be here, and thank you so much for this award tonight. Thanks, Bob, and congratulations. Our honoree tonight is Debbie Wynn, a Norfolk native and lifelong resident of the region, 
who after distinguishing himself in state and national service, is now turning the focus of his considerable energies to the future of Hampton Roads. Joining us tonight to share some insight into the, his friend of more than 40 years is last year's Darden Award winner and my colleague at Kaufman and Canoles, Vince Mastracco. Good evening. It's great to be here tonight. Uh, and I want to welcome Dubby and his family here. Uh, his wife Susan is with him. Uh, John and Catherine are here. Uh, his son Brad and Katie uh, live in Charlotte and they couldn't be here tonight, but I'm absolutely certain they're thinking about you. And uh, Julie, who's Susan's sister, and John Walker are here as well. So, Dubby, I know you've got lots of friends and, and family in the audience tonight, and they all wish you well. This is really a rare opportunity for me to make a few public comments about Dubby. Recognition for Dubby's most gifted leadership is not something he either seeks or wants. We all know that he's a very private person, and what he does for the community, he simply does it for its betterment. He tried to put me on terms tonight about my comments, and I, he said, uh, I said, the, Dubby said, well, how long are you going to talk? And I said, I don't know, six or seven minutes? He said, make it two. So I said, okay. But W, you are on the hot seat tonight. So sit back, take a deep breath, and relax, because we're here to talk about you. And nothing we can say can adequately describe the tremendous impact you've had on this community. W has a passion that is uncompromising. He's determined to do the right thing, even though it's not the most popular path. He exhaustively explores all possibilities until the solution emerges. Once the decision is made, get out of the way for baby steps are not in his vocabulary. <laughs> Although Virginia Beach is his home, his influence and leadership extend far beyond Hampton Roads. Princeton University occupies a very important component of his life. He and his sons John and Brad are graduates. W received an AB from Princeton, served on the Board of Trustees for an earlier term of 10 years, and currently serves as a trustee again today. And in addition, he has recently served as chairman of Princeton's annual campaign. He earned his law degree from the University of Virginia and worked with the Wilcox Law Firm and was fortunate to migrate to the business world in only two, two years, where he rose to be president and CEO of Landmark Communications. There are a number of people in this room tonight that worked with Frank Batten and Dubby on one of Landmark's properties, the Weather Channel. The story Frank Batten describes in his book on the Weather Channel tells an intriguing tale that called on the wisdom, finesse, and sheer hard work that overcame the many obstacles to success. Dubby's leadership at the Weather Channel is noted by Frank Batten in his book, where he wrote, at the risk of embarrassing him, I want to state for the record that the Weather Channel will always be indebted to W. Wynn. Even when the outlook was darkest, Wynn continu continued to believe in the Weather Channel. During a period of terrible and tragic illness in his family, he put himself almost constantly on the road to meet with operators. We needed his personal determination to save our venture, and he willingly gave us that commitment. It was an enormous personal sacrifice, which I will never forget. Without W. Wynn, the Weather Channel could not have survived. And I want to personally thank you, Dubby, because every night when I go to bed, I turn on the Weather Channel and always sleep a little better, knowing that tomorrow it'll be 72 degrees and sunny somewhere. Right. <laughs> uh, uh, among his numerous and important public boards and commissions, I was privileged to serve with him on the UVA board. He as rector spearheaded efforts for sound planning practices in teaching, research, and health care. He challenged himself and those around him to understand how the plan should work and would the plan, if executed, get you to the right strategic place. As rector, in my opinion, his most significant accomplishment was his leadership in a search for the president of the university. His leadership in that process is legend. He studied the options, sought out and listened to multiple constituencies, and thoroughly assimilated them. He led a timely, effective, and successful effort during the process, he set up the bar high and he met the challenge. He expected members of the committee to stay involved, to be present, and to participate. Frequently, he would go around the room and insist on comments. 
He wanted to know where you stood and where you engaged. Now, there are, there are people that would say that Dubby is intense. Maybe, maybe a better word is that he's passionate, and he's passionate to understand the issues, respect independent thinking, solve the problem, and then suggest credit should be given to others. Educational excellence has been a hallmark of his interest. Just about every commission, task force, or advisor group that has fo was focused on higher education in the Commonwealth of Virginia in recent years have been the beneficiaries of his wisdom. A few, no few noteworthy ones are the Virginia Business for Higher Education Commission. They actually in instigated and, and got past the Grow by Degrees initiative. He and his friend Haywood Fraylin convinced Governor McDonald and the legislature to fund higher education to support an additional 100,000 bachelor degrees in Virginia, finally recognizing higher education as a priority. He's been a trustee of the State Council of Higher Education, and he was on the Governor's Commission on Higher Education, Reforms, Innovation, and Involvement. And is Vice Chair of the Council on Virginia's Future. Paul Frame and another number of leaders in Virginia developed performance standards and metrics for state government. Now, Dubby's a good role model for retirees. He often introduces himself, he always introduces himself, as a former landmark executive. Now, suppose it's accurate to describe him as a former landmark executive, but being retired is a little bit of a misnomer. <laughs> Typically, people retire, when they retire, they make a bucket list to travel, to explore exotic places, play golf every day, and check off leisure activities that they had little time for during their working years. But Dubby's bucket list is a lot different. He has a central core and goal to make this a better community. He doesn't even have to say that's his goal. His actions control. He sets up a plan, creates initiative, leads by example, and changes the game. He and his friend Harry Lester are co-founders of the Business Roundtable. The rationale there is that communities should not just be localities engaged in competition with each other, but communities joining together to engage in creating strong business environments that make them more globally competitive. In this way, Hampton Rose is viewed as a single metropolis and acting as one communicating to the world that this region is ready to accept common goals. Dubby's vision is one that is an advanced picture of our region's potential. He's an attentive listener, finds his place, recognizing valuable patterns, and sets out to make a difference. Now he chairs the Hampton Roads Community Foundation, created by the Norfolk Foundation and the Virginia Beach Foundation. He believes the foundation is having a vested interest in encouraging economic competition and sees that as central to the foundation's strategy and mission. This aspirational strategy embraced by the foundation is not foreign to him at all. If you think about him and his style of leadership, you know that this is the way he approaches his game. In the process, though, you see a man with respect for others, compassion for those less fortunate, and one always willing to go the extra mile. With him always is his strongest link, his beautiful and wonderful and supportive wife, Susan. They have to make sure that his compass is pointed in the right direction. He is a great friend of mine for whom this award is most fitting. And thank you, Dubby. But I'm not the only friend who thinks the world of you. In a few moments here on the video, you're going to see, see and hear some of your other friends that will tell you a lot more. Thanks. Dubby and I have been friends for over 50 years, and looking back over that, that period of time, it's, it's clear to me that he has made some significant impacts on me and my life, and it's truly been a privilege to have him as a friend. Dubby has profound respect for Josh Darden, or up until recently, they shared an office together. Uh, they bounced a lot of ideas off of each other, they had similar interests, a University of Virginia, a higher education, economic development. I know he looks to Josh as a very, very special person. I know for a fact he struggled with whether or not he was gonna accept this award or not because he didn't want to be in the spotlight. And in the end, I think he is accepting it because A, it's a tribute to Josh, and he's a close friend of Josh's. And B, I think he sees this as a forum to impart his belief that we have to work harder and smarter to make Hampton Roads a better place to live. I'd say W. Wynn is a really smart guy. That, 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 that helps in being effective. Um, ran a big company, careful what he works on. He's generous with his time.
Did I say he's really smart? This is his hometown. So, it's, so he sees the, 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 the historical drivers of this economy in the port, tourism, uh, in military defense related spending. And he's, he's saying, let's not abandon those, but, but let's look at what they ought to look like in this, this, this new normal, this, this new century. Then let's find the turbo power for the economy. Let's go and look where we've never looked before and, 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 and let's uh, dream big things and have big thoughts. This initiative that has um, uh, begun to take hold at the Foundation on Regional Economic Competitiveness uh, is, is focused within that context. He's interested genuinely in what makes Hampton Roads a better place, place to live, what can be done uh, from a competitive standpoint to make us more successful as a region. And I think he genuinely wants to be uh, someone who helps to leave this region a better place than he found it. Debbie's chairman of the Hampton Roads Community Foundation, and the foundation under his uh, under his uh, leadership is working on uh, various aspects of economic competitiveness. That's what he's all about. Let's figure out how we can do a better job at what we do. His record is clear as it relates to his commitment to higher education, whether it's his involvement at uh, University of Virginia, whether it's his involvement at Princeton. Uh, his role has been significant, everything from his role as rector of the University of Virginia to his leadership with the Virginia Business Higher Ed Council to his leadership with the Governor's Commission on Higher Education. You, you look at any place Virginia has an avenue for access to higher education and W's at the front of the line. And when we started this program, about 42% of the workforce had a college degree. We're up to 45%. Our objective by 2025 is to get over 50%. We hope in truth that we can even exceed that. That will not happen unless we make further investment. He understands the balance between what we have to do in higher education and how we have to do a better job of merging the private sector and, and the public sector for the common good. One of Dubby's strengths as a leader is that he himself engages in alternative thinking. Let's uh, dream big things and have big thoughts. We need more deeper thinking on this topic. He's big into saying, let's have deep thinking, deep thinking, very deep thinking. Have you done some deep thinking? Well, of course I've done deep thinking. I've been deep thinking about this for the last month. He'd drive you nuts. It's often that way of thinking that comes up with an idea, a concept, a plan that can really be a game changer. He has said on more than one occasion that Frank Batten was the most influential person on his life. Where's our contribution and how will we leave our mark? Um, that mark is rooted in the degree to which we take our success in business, whatever that is, the business acumen, whatever it is, and apply that to these larger issues of, of community that impact upon all of us. Our next uh, honoree is John O. Wynn of Virginia, and I'd like to call upon Governor Tim Kaine. In his mind, it is a responsibility for him to be involved and to contribute and to help orchestrate change and improvement and, and ultimately make this community a better place. By the committee, Dubby, congratulations. In its simplest terms, Dubby has a real commitment to making things better. I know that is of major concern to Dubby as he looks, for example, to where's the next generation? Who will succeed him? Where are the Dubby wins, I would ask.
Thank you, UW, for all you've done and all you're doing for Hampton Roads. There are note cards outside the doors where we can write a note of congratulations to Dubby on this special evening. Dubby spoke powerfully about the role of mentors in our lives. And I'm delighted to introduce you to some of the civic scholars who are helping with tonight's event. They're all outside. They're all outside, helping with the event outside. Okay. Um, uh, civic scholars are exceptional students from Old Dominion University who are part of a pilot program designed to connect them with mentors from the Civic Leadership Interest Institute. And I especially want to thank those of you who are serving as mentors to these young people. Debbie, I'd like to present this award to you as a token of our appreciation for all you do for our community. Well, thanks, folks. Uh, on a Tuesday night in December, you all are very kind to come out. I know Bob feels the same way. Uh, Vince, thanks for those exaggerated but kind words. Uh, obviously, you're a good longtime friend, and, and I very much appreciate it. Uh, and thank you, Civic, for this award. It's especially meaningful to me, as Tommy said in the video, because it's named for Josh, uh, my dear friend who's really been an inspiration to every one of us in this room in one way or another. And Betty, his wife, is here, and Betty, we're particularly thrilled you're here. Uh, and Bob, congratulations to you and Town Bank. Uh, you and your associates are absolutely wonderful role models for the entire community. We're really lucky to have you here, and I mean that sincerely. <laughs> As everyone here knows, rarely is one person responsible for success. Uh, so really this award is accepted by me on behalf of all of the talented people that I've had the pleasure and opportunity to work with uh, for the betterment of Hampton Road. So really, in many ways, this is, uh, I'm accepting this for you. So thanks to all of you. You all know who you are, and I really appreciate it. Uh, I especially want to thank my wife, Susan. Vince mentioned Susan. She's right here. Who's A lot of you don't know her, obviously, like I do, but if you knew this woman, she is, uh, she is sensational. This doesn't happen to me. Uh, her values and judgment and insights and, frankly, her lifelong interest in helping others, and I mean that, and those of you that know her closely know that, has inspired me and really allowed me to do the things that I do. And believe me, honey, uh, you're the real hero and I know it. So, thanks. <laughs> and we're lucky uh, tonight, our son John, our oldest son, and his wife Catherine are, live here and they're here with us tonight. And Catherine had the duty of coming. Today is Catherine's birthday. Happy birthday, Catherine. <laughs> we love you, honey. Now, I am aware, as my friend Harry Lester has told me any number of times, of the importance of brevity in awards talks. And I think Woody Allen probably had it right when he gave a commencement address with 10 words. We've given you a good world, don't screw it up. <laughs> and then he sat down. I'll be brief, not that brief. But if you'll indulge me for a couple of minutes, I would like to talk about a subject that I think is really important to the community. And that's about improving and expanding volunteer civic leadership, and more specifically, how we can better engage and empower the next generation of leaders through a more deliberate and purposeful process. All of us, I think, would agree that great leaders will advance our community. The most extraordinary people, the more extraordinary people we can engage and help ensure, assume leadership positions, the more success we will have. That's a given, we all know that in all of our experiences. Uh, in fact, I would probably say that the single most significant thing we can do, we talk about transportation, economic development, all these things, I really think the single most important thing we can do is develop more gifted leaders and empower them to do their thing. If we do that, we can get out of the way and great things are going to happen. Your bank is a good example of that. You know, you've done just that all over the place. 
Uh, all the literature on leadership identifies mentoring as an important aspect of individual and leadership development. Each of us here has benefited from mentors who have helped us, and each of us here undoubtedly has done some mentoring, either formally or informally. And over my years, I have benefited from several significant mentors. Actually, several people are here that I'm not mentioning that have had an impact on my life, but I want to mention three in particular that have had a major impact on me. A person you may not know is J.B. Massey. J.B. Massey was the headmaster at Norfolk Academy, 50s, 60s, and early 70s, who elevated Norfolk Academy into a serious school and started the momentum building that goes on where the Norfolk Academy, of course, is a nationally re uh, renowned school. He took a special interest in me, in me, and really he took it because I was such a poor and disinterested student. <laughs> and uh, it's just the truth. I was interested in sports, so he decided he was going to take me out of athletics until I got on the honor roll. Now, you have to understand the gap between where I was and honor roll. <laughs> pretty significant, and the honest truth is, I cried. I, was, I couldn't believe what he was telling you. He couldn't be real. You didn't mean it. He meant it. He said, there's no negotiation. Go hit it. Well, that was my first real experience with tough love. I was lucky enough to get on the honor roll pretty quickly, and so I got back at sports. That was a big risk. I mean, to come from where I was to get to where I got uh, might not have worked. Uh, but somehow this was a guy that saw more in me than I saw in myself. And of course he changed my life. So at an early age, my opportunity set for a lifetime change. Just change. Uh, and every year after I graduated in 1963, and he didn't need to do this, this became an informal relationship. After that formal relationship, we would meet and communicate. Any of our kids had an athletic event, didn't matter where it was in the state, if he was within 100 miles, he came. He did the same thing for the Rugers. He had a special relationship with them as well. And he was an enormous force of encouragement to me. He was always writing me notes. Anytime he'd see anything in the paper, read something, he just always sent me a note. Now, he didn't need to do that. He had thousands of kids over time that went through this place. Well, you can imagine how I felt about him. Toy Savage, who was here tonight, I don't know if he's still here, senior partner at Wilcox Savage, where I worked before Landmark, spent endless hours with me, teaching me to write properly, to analyze properly, to consider options and nuances, and really started building my confidence because he showed confidence in me. And this came at a time when this will surprise you because I seem so confident, but when as a young lawyer with no practical experience, I had real doubts about my ability. And you have to gain that through experience. You have to understand that you can contribute. Well, he helped me. And he's been there ever since for me as a mentor, opening doors, inter introducing me to new topics and people, and always encouraging and available. A lifetime. Frank Batten Sr. Uh, this is a very, as Tommy said, there's a very special man in my life. Um, he had an enormous impact on me from the time I joined Landmark until his death 35 years later. Like Toy, he was my employer, but he became a special friend. Really, to me, he was a second father or a big brother. Uh, he knew I cared very deeply for him. Uh, I had real affection for the man. It went much beyond uh, our business relationship. We talked about everything, and business was part of it. We talked about life. We talked about values. We talked about everything. And we knew we could count on each other. As a mentor to me and many others in Landmark, he was a sounding board more than anything else. It was his style to listen, question, pose options, but almost never to tell you what to do. Honestly, I can't remember one time in my life when he told me what to do. We'd keep talking, we'd keep talking, and it became obvious. Now that's, how many of us go through that? I mean, that's a real role modeling. And he knew how to do it. And he did it with a lot of people in Landmark. Like others in Landmark, he gave me responsibility that before my experience really qualified me. And later when I asked why, he said, you'll make mistakes, but you'll acknowledge and correct them and be better for it. You know we have high standards in Landmark, but I know your own internal standards will motivate you to succeed. Figure out how to lead well. Loaded words. And if you need help, there are plenty of us with experience that are happy to have discussions. Think of this tone. I mean, those of you, there are a lot of my friends here from Landmark and Dominion who are here tonight. You know exactly what I'm talking about. 
That's a unique culture. I sense, Bob, you all have the same kind of culture. Uh, and he opened a lot of doors for me. I mean, I was lucky because Landmark had a stature in the community and a lot of us were involved with civic but, uh, activities, but you all know he always encouraged everybody to give back. And, and you've seen some stories in that other brochure about some experiences I had and how he encouraged me. So this is what mentoring has done for me. Now what I'm proposing tonight is that we take mentoring to a new level in Hampton Roads and do it more formally. So here's the idea. We would formalize a mentoring process whereby initially 12 of us, many of you are here tonight, who have had high level experience in business, government, and our civic life, will agree to each mentor two younger leaders, somewhere in their 30s to their 50s, in specific mutual areas of civic interest. Initially, we would seek to identify uh, those who have shown ability, interest, and commitment to the community. Mentoring, as you know, depends on compatibility, so it is somewhat more difficult until a relationship is established. So each mentor we're proposing would select someone they know, and they'd select someone they don't know, uh, but where are their mutual interests. Lists are available to identify candidates, and anyone can feel free to add their name to the list. This will be a pilot project. This won't be a full-blown project, obviously. And we're encouraged to think that a number of our younger leaders would like to participate in just such a process. Because the number of slots will necessarily be limited in the beginning, selection will be somewhat arbitrary, and you get it. Uh, if it's too big and so forth, we won't be able to get through it. Over time, obviously, the processes will need to be formalized and improved. But from the beginning, efforts are going to have to be made to select a diverse group, both of mentors and mentees. Some matchups may not work, and adjustments may have to be made. And mentors, we propose, would meet at least quarterly, face to face with their mentees, and be available as sounding boards as needed. And the second part of this, though, is what I think can really make it work. We want to inventory the civic boards and affiliations of each mentor. The mentor will approach the selected board to determine if the organization will be willing to take one or two of the mentees as either ex officio or short term board members. Some boards may already have an adequate number population of young leaders, but most do not. The hope would be that the mentee would be formally oriented and put to work to help the organization. The relationship would end at the conclusion of two years and the person would either become on the board in a prominent role or the relationship would cease. I had just such an experience when I was 32 and I was alumni chair at Norfolk Academy. And as such, I was an ex officio board member. Frank or Josh, I can't remember which, was chair of the board at the time and asked me to do a comparative analysis of faculty compensation as they suspected pay was too low, way too much disparity between the public systems and the private. With the help of staff, we did the work, the board adopted new policies, and shortly thereafter, I was asked to join the full board as a full-time member. In this sort of way, it is felt that we could involve more young leaders in our most significant and impactful organizations and see what they've got, witness what they're doing, give them an opportunity to show with real meaningful work, not just coming to a meeting to rubber stamp an agenda, but with real meaningful work. Where we already have uh, great young leaders in position, we need to take it to another level also, and that is to conscientiously provide them with more responsibility sooner too many of us have been doing this for decades and need to get out of the way and bring in that next generation and stay with them until they get to a point of success. Bruce Bradley has a study group that's sponsored by the Community Foundation focusing on improving civic leadership in Hampton Roads and other ideas will clearly emerge from that group. Troy Savage has made us aware of another technique that's used elsewhere, principally in Nashville and a couple of other cities, where you compile a book of potential young leaders every year and you show their interest in resumes and you update it and it becomes a source. I mean, how many boards have we all been on say, you know, I really would like a person that, or this or that or the other and no names come up. Well, this could be obviously a good resource tool. So I've talked, as I mentioned, to a number of the potential mentors. Every one of them is enthusiastic. Every one of them is willing to give their time. Uh, we need to work on the mechanics, of course. We'd expect to get this up and running by late spring. I think this will be a go. We haven't decided where we're going to park it. We'll have to figure all that out. But the truth is it has to be broader than just civic, Kathy. We have to let everybody participate. 
And uh, of course, this effort does not preclude enhanced mentoring efforts by anybody else in any other relevant way. This is just an initiative. So wouldn't it be great if Hampton Roads became known as the region most committed to developing the next generation of leadership? So I'm really humbled by tonight, and I thank you again for this wonderful award and, and, and from the support of so many of my friends who are here. So thank you very much. Thank you, Debbie. I'd like to ask Ed Power to join me, the chair of the Darden Award event. Um, as I mentioned earlier, um, there are note cards outside where you can write your congratulations to Debbie. Dessert and coffee are now being served, and we hope you'll stay around to enjoy the company and the conversation. Thanks again for joining us tonight. Thanks. Thanks.